Hello fellow book bookquesters, it is I, Aaron the Bookquester. Today, I have this book, Legend of Warm by Tracy Dion, and let's get straight into the review. So, as usual, I'm going to give you guys a basic plot summary, my analysis, and then kind of my take on the book. So let's get straight into it. Summary. Uh, the main character is a girl named Bree, who is on the cover right here, this is Bree, and she gets into this cool EC summer program, UNC Chapel Hill, and she is quite excited for it. It's like an early college program, and she's very, very hyped for it. However, right before she's about to go, her mom is dead. And her mom gets killed by some kind of hit and run. She's overcome with grief. And we get this opener. This book opens with her being overrun by grief and trying to handle that grief while being at this early summer program. However, on her literal first day there, she goes to, she attends a party that's pretty much illegal for people to go because you have boundaries that you have to stay within and she didn't stay within those boundaries. And there, she witnesses a magical attack. A demon who calls them legendborn and the, these, a boy and a girl with a bow and magical abilities killing the demon. And the demon calls them legendborn and Merlin. Interesting. And basically, she is then mesmerized or hypnotized by that boy who uses magic. And she, however, that hypnotism that like erases her memories of that event kind of comes back. And she realizes that it's not true, you know, like that, those memories are fake. Actually, she remembers what actually happened with magic and the demons. So, however, she gets into trouble because of what she did with the principal. Oh, well, with the Dean, I guess? I don't know, who cares? And basically, she, he assigns someone, Nick Davis, a person named Nick Davis, to him as a babysitter, basically. Although he, she thankfully doesn't get expelled. And basically, she, at this point, realizes that mag this is not the first time she's seen this mesmerizing magic thing. Um, what she does, she, the first time she did see this magic thing was the night of her mother's death. A policeman had mesmerized him, which makes her think that perhaps the death of her mother was caused by this secret magician, legend-born Merlin order or whatever. And then she realizes that Nick Davis, her um, her part, no, her supervisor, question mark, her student help, I don't know what to call him, um, he is basically a legend born as well, and she rescues her from a hellhound attack of, of some kind of hell monster, and we get this idea that, oh crap, you know, Nick Davis is a big shot in this area. So, we, we get this idea, and Bree kind of realizes that she might need to get into the Order, this secret society club thing, the Knights of the Round Table, Arthurian BS, in order to find out about what happened to her mom that night. So, we get this event, she gets in, and she basically goes in as Nick's page, which is like a partner, a potential partner, or a recommend a person under recommendation from a legend born. And these legend born are actually descendants of King Arthur or the Knights of the Round Table, which is all very cool and awesome. So we get this situation, and she realizes, oh, there's magic, um, they come from the descendants of King Arthur, and we got these demons that these guys are fighting against. Basically, we're trying to prevent Camelon from happen happening, which is like the apocalypse, you know, which is like, you know, Ragnarok, with all the demons coming up in the final battle against the good and the bad. Cool. And as she trains and trains and tries to get a hold of her newfound abilities, because apparently she can use red flames now and it's all very strange and she doesn't know what's going on, uh, slowly the plot gets uncovered. And as she does that, she falls in love with Nick Davis, which is honestly kind of the most typical premise that everyone expected, but indeed did happen. And that's kind of where the story goes. Now I'm going to skip a bunch of the details and get to the two main plot twists, which I'm going to talk to you about because number one is kind of relevant to my analysis later on. So first of all, the bad guy is Lord Davis. Oh my gosh, who could have thought? Lord Davis is the father of Nick Davis. Basically, he wants Camelon to happen. Um, Camelon being the apocalyptic final battle between the demons and the knights because he wants the basically his son to regain the full power of King Arthur. Context needed to understand this. Basically, you go from the lowest ranked knight from King Arthur's table up until King Arthur, and as Camelon goes nearer and nearer, each knight is awakened. So like, you know, Gawain gets awakened, then someone else gets awakened, then someone else gets awakened, then Lancelot gets awakened, and finally King Arthur gets awakened. So it's like a it's like a ticking timer, you know. The the knights the knights' powers get handed down to their descendants 
in order of the lowest rank to the highest, depending on the threat that's going on. And if Camelon happens, King Arthur comes up. And basically, he just wants the power, and he just wants to fulfill this honorable legacy. I, I don't really know what his logic is. It's it's a little it's a little iffy, but whatever. We'll let that pass. And also, the second twist is that her mom is was a root crafter who uses this like magic for woman, not woman necessarily, but from her kind. Um, it's a different type of magic from the blood crafting, which is essentially what the Arthurian people use, which is binding their ancestors' power to them. It's all very convoluted, but that's kind of the difference. And then the second main twist as I was actually about to get to is that she, Bree, is actually the real descendant of King Arthur because her ancestor was appointed by a white slave master who happened to be King Arthur's descendant. Um, yeah. That's that's cool, and she's actually the King Arthur descendant. She's very very powerful, and she wipes everyone out at the end. And that's that's actually the entire book. Now, let's actually get into the meat of the stuff, which is the analysis of my take. So first of all, the themes we have dealing with racism, um, the importance and yet the hypocriticalness and the dangers of following tradition tradition blindly. And I think, first of all, I think it's a really good balance of respecting the Arthurian legends and the source material, while also pointing out the terrible bad parts about it, right? Kind of the white elitism, the, the tradition in ways it can be cool, right, with all the powers and the knights and tradition and your fate to fight against demons, you know, there's cool stuff like that, but there's also bad stuff like, you know, namely, you know, the racism, right, and the conformism and the conservationism. So that's... um. An interesting way to put it. Um, and then we've got the kind of the main twist that I wanted to talk about, which is the main character being King Arthur's heir. I think that's a really interesting and good way to kind of transition this terrible past of slavery, right, that's in the US, and transition it into a cool power. She has her rootcraft powers, which is like a kind of that was born from that slavery, right? That was born from that terrible past, manifested as her power. And at the same time, we've got the Arthur power. She is the descendant of King Arthur, so King Arthur comes with her body and she can use Excalibur and stuff like that. So we got this fusion of, of her taking control of her past and finding her identity as an American, as a black girl American in this modern day and age. I thought that was really cool. However, I also thought that it was a missed opportunity to introduce some kind of African legends or African kind of myth or folklore because I felt like you know th there's a lack of exploration in terms of going further back into the past um, and finding more magic stuff because like obviously we've got stuff from the Arthurian legends and that's been used a thousand times right like the darkest rising is a really great example of Arthurian legends done well and I thought Although this book obviously did those Arthurian legends very, very well, I felt like it was a missed opportunity to, to do a proper fusion of Arthurian legend and African folklore or legend, or even better, Native American folklore or legend. Literally anything else, right? Something that's a little more underrepresented. And I felt like if we did that, the story would have become a lot more interesting. However, I thought, again, what happened here was thematically extremely good. Uh, my main criticisms was definitely the fight scenes. The fight scenes felt like, I felt like there was a very strong image of how the Aether looked like, the, the magical particle things looked like, but I felt like, you know, I could never really visualize where characters were exactly kind of in the battlefield, which created a lack of tension sometimes. I also thought the pacing was fast and pretty good, and it kind of let me rip through this in one sitting, and I thought that's also a good thing, but at the same time, we could have used a little more slow things to kind of sit with Bree's grief because I didn't think we really got to do that. Um, especially when she found out about what happened to her mother and she was wrong. I felt like we could have gotten a bit more deeper exploration into her psyche. Um, I feel like there's actually a more deeper exploration of her, her, her feelings for Nick than her grief, which I think is, you know, it's fine, but we could have used more grief. I thought that would be cool. <laughs> And that's kind of generally my takes on it. Very good book. I actually really liked this book. I thought it was excellent. Um, I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought it would. Thought I would. Um, so that's about it. And like always, your bookquester, Aaron the bookquester. 
probably a 7 out of 10, let's say. And yeah, would recommend for a good read. Goodbye.